contains? How do they differ? Why do they differ? Um, and how are both of us going to meet our optimal nutritional status? So what do you think? What are some of, it, what are some of the things, all these arrows, I widened it out so we could have a little discussion. So what do you think some of these factors are that influence our intake and our requirements? And, um, and this really is what we're going to be talking about this entire class. So kind of thinking about what are some of these things, this is what we're going to be talking about. Yeah. So like disease status? Absolutely. Yeah, so disease status is going to impact our nutritional requirements. It's also going to impact our intake in different ways. Yes. Uh, physical activity. Physical activity, sure. So that's going to change our requirements based on how much activity that you're doing. Sure. So I'm going to go with both of those. We have our sort of cultural and social system, you know, being raised to like different foods maybe and have different beliefs that are going to impact our intake. But then our genetics are going to also impact our requirements. You know, if you have a genetic predisposition for dyslipidemia or hypertension or any of these chronic diseases, right, and if we metabolize in different ways uh, because of our genetics, that's going to impact our requirements. Yeah, yeah, age, absolutely. So across the lifespan, we have different requirements. Environment? Yes, environment. So tell me about that. I had to think a little bit about environment because that is one of them. Um, Give me an example. Just, like accessibility of like produce? Okay, yeah. So what's going to impact our intake is what is in our environment and our accessibility to these foods. Can we think about environment in any other way also? Okay, so our influences from the people that are around us, so access to food, our influences, even just like I was thinking, our environment. Say you live in a really stressful environment. <laughs> Stress can dictate your intake. Stress can, can change your physiology, right? Stress can cause irritable bowel syndrome and cause malabsorption. <laughs> um, so stress is part of our environment. Toxins, um, foodborne illness from our environment. I mean, a lot of different things in our environment can impact our nutritional status. Good. So that's basically what this class is about, is investigating all of these factors that impact our nutritional status. So we spend a lot of time investigating, which is fun if you like to investigate. <laughs> if you like to think, apply critical thinking, dive into somebody and examine everything that you just said about them to really understand their nutritional status, hi. Um, and then applying interventions to optimize their nutritional status. So the process of investigation is called the nutrition care process that I already mentioned to you. Investigating Coming up with the problem is the nutrition care process. And our interventions are often called medical nutrition therapy. So you'll hear dietitians say, what's the MNT? So we use it like, you know, a noun. What, what is that intervention? What's the MNT? Um, so that's what MNT is. But it goes beyond that. Uh, so what technically is medical nutrition therapy? There is actually legislation dictating the definition of what medical nutrition therapy is. It's nutritional diagnostic therapy and counseling services, so it's a diagnose, therapy and counseling, for the purpose of disease management, which are furnished by a registered dietitian or a nutrition professional. So we diagnose nutrition problems, we provide therapy and counseling services for disease management. So medical nutrition therapy, medical meaning disease, some disease or condition. So what are our interventions to help manage a disease? Because as somebody mentioned, disease impacts our nutritional requirements greatly for healing, infection, they alter our labs, they alter the ability of our liver to work, our kidneys to work, our lungs to work, our heart to work, you know? Disease impacts all of our physiology. And so we need to adjust our nutrition recommendations based on those physiological changes 
from the disease state. So, it's now been expanded a little bit more, the definition of medical nutrition therapy, to include some prevention. So if you look at the third bullet point, use of specific evidence-based nutrition interventions to prevent or manage an illness, injury, or condition. So I was really trying to think of what is medical nutrition therapy. It's so part of what we do that it's hard for me to like say what exactly it is. So I was looking on the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics website and they included this prevent disease under the MNT toolkit and resources for MNT. So and that's important, you know, we definitely want to prevent disease. That is why we, probably so many of us are in this room, right? Are we here because we want to prevent disease in the first place? Yeah, for the most part. Um, can we see every single person in this world to, to prevent disease? You know, is that sustainable? Is that possible? Not so much. So if you really want to prevent disease, we have to think about population programs, right? Public health, reaching large groups of people. Um, as a dietitian, I still practice. I see patients every week. I'm really proud to say that. I'm, right now they're trying to change days on me and I'm like, oh, it doesn't really work, but I, I really want to keep doing this because it's great. I like it. I really enjoy it. Um, and I get to talk about it in class, so it makes me a little bit more interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I like to think. Um, so, oh, so as a, a dietitian, when I'm seeing patients, can I sit there all day and do one on one sessions with healthy people? Nobody's going to really pay me to do that so much. At least the healthcare system isn't going to pay me to do that. There's not enough bang for the buck, right? That person may or may not get a disease in their life. They want to send me high risk people. So people that maybe are starting to have some kind of condition or sign of a condition or a disease, and they want me to help them to prevent progression of that disease, right? So what kind of, what kind of prevention is that called? Has anybody heard of primary, secondary, tertiary prevention? These are important terms. Yes, you have? Okay. Remind me of your name. Hannah, Hannah I thought so, but then you said you're gonna be late. Yeah, I didn't have to. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm like, ah. Oh. Um, Okay, well, prevention, primary, secondary, tertiary, or you could call it primordial, primary, and secondary. I'm not classifying these because looking <laughs> now at different resources, different organizations are classifying these types of prevention in different ways, but it's basically understanding that there's a spectrum of prevention. So you could call this primordial prevention or primary prevention, depending on, again, which organization, which is preventing disease before it ever occurs. Okay, so right now I'm a, I'm a primary prevention patient. Um, I don't have any conditions that I know of and I'm a healthy individual, so I'm a primary prevention patient. Healthcare system, are they gonna inv invest a lot in me with a dietitian to prevent a disease? Not necessarily, they might not pay for it because I'm healthy. I may get a disease, I may not get a disease, right? Um, but secondary prevention, some people call this primary prevention, is preventing disease development by managing risk factors in early signs, such as impaired fasting glucose, stage one hypertension, reduced iron so stores. So there's some sign of a condition starting to occur. This person's at higher risk. So that individual might be referred to a dietitian, and we would be applying medical nutrition therapy because we're trying to prevent a worsening of a condition and preventing a disease from occurring. Does that make sense? And then tertiary prevention, some people call secondary prevention, um, is preventing lasting effects and advanced complications by managing more complicated events. So diabetes, or if somebody's actually had a heart attack, they're gonna be at higher risk for a second heart attack or death. Somebody that's had a heart attack is gonna be at risk for stroke. Um, somebody that has high blood pressure, we just want to prevent the stroke to begin with, and then here, say somebody's had a stroke, we want to prevent another stroke. We want to prevent an additional heart attack. We want to prevent death. So these people um, are at further, further along in the disease spectrum, and we're trying to prevent the further effects <coughs> out there. So why am I telling you this? Because I was trying to figure out what medical nutrition therapy was. Does it include prevention? And I would say it includes <coughs> 
secondary and tertiary prevention, but maybe not primary. Primary prevention is where we're keeping healthy people healthy, and that's gonna be general nutrition information. You can do that now. How many of you do that already? You're talking to your roommates about eating healthy. That's primary prevention, right? Um, somebody stops you on the street and asks you a nutrition question because they know that you're studying nutrition. So that happens all the time, right? Primary prevention. How many of you are peer nutrition educators with Toby Morris and the Tang Center? Okay, so you're going to be doing primary prevention, working with healthy people, talking about healthy habits, nutrition education. That's not medical nutrition therapy. Medical nutrition therapy is preventing disease and really that primary and secondary prevention. So that's kind of semantics um, because we actually use the same process and the process is called the nutrition care process. So what we're going to learn in this class is the process of understanding somebody and applying interventions to optimize their nutritional status and disease is just part of that. Disease is part of that process and understanding that person. And when we're really going to talk about diseases is in 161B. <laughs> so in this class, about 40% of it is talking about um, the nutrition care process and nutritional status assessment, the investigation, diving in deep with people. Um, and then about 30% is applying that process to the life cycle, the lifespan, sorry, the lifespan. Um, and understanding the nutritional needs from pregnancy through aging, and understanding common medical conditions that occur throughout, because that's going to impact their nutritional status. So we'll talk about diseases that are common in each of those, but we're really gonna talk about the lifespan and how that changes one's nutritional status. And then, um, I don't know, I got my percentages wrong, but like the last 20% is applying this to cardiovascular disease being the number one cause of death, um, and it's my background, I worked at the Cardiovascular Disease Research Institute for seven years, so I take that segment of the disease states and we talk about it in 161A. And then in 161B, we go through many other disease states that have nutrition implications. Diabetes and kidney disease, pulmonary disease, cancer, critical care patients, et cetera. Um, so this lays the foundation for that. This class also lays the foundation for nutrition education and counseling. Because again, when you counsel somebody and educate somebody, you have to have investigated them and understood them to be able to make sure that your interventions are effective, right? You can't just sit there and tell somebody what to do. It's not gonna work. So, any questions? Yes? Is the difference that how Okay, so it's either primordial, primordial, like everybody, primordial, okay, look it up. Primordial, <laughs> primary, <laughs> secondary, or it's primary, secondary, tertiary. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I recommend it. Different organizations call it different things, different um, conditions, like the American Heart Association calls it something different, from public health. And, kind of confusing, so I don't try to classify it so much anymore. Yes? Uh, so just to clarify, you said primary prevention isn't medical nutrition therapy, so the first bullet point we have to consider in primary prevention? Yeah, I mean that's, I think that's, a, I think Mary and I were hashing it out, Dr. Messer and I, um, and we would agree, we agreed <laughs> that the first point is just going to be health education, but thank you for bringing that up. Um, because, let's go back to medical nutrition therapy, the definition. I've now talked about prevention and managing disease, but another way MNT has been classified, I worked um, on the practice guidelines for cardiovascular disease with a group of panel members, and, and we teased this out for a long time. Another way that MNT is classified is based on number one, an in-depth, individualized nutrition assessment. So for MNT to occur, although it's managing a, a disease, there has to be an in-depth, individualized nutrition assessment that goes along with it. So for example, if I am working in a heart disease clinic and I just walk into a patient's room and I you know, say, okay, they have heart disease, here's what you have to do, blah, 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 is that MNT? 
I'm giving education based on the disease state, but do I really know what's going on with that individual? How do I know what lipid disorder that person has? How do I know what you know their fluid level is? Do they have heart failure? Are they retaining fluids? How do I know they haven't had a stroke and they're having a difficult time swallowing? There's so many other things going on with that patient. We can say that's not MNT. That's just nutrition education for a disease state. But that nutrition assessment, that first step, that in-depth, individualized nutrition assessment, some people feel like that is what is most important in classified MNT. And that's what sets the registered dietitian and other nutrition professionals, perhaps, that are trained apart from, let's say, a health educator that is giving education based on the disease state, right? So what sets us apart, what sets dietitians apart is this first step of an individualized nutrition assessment. Diving in deep, making it personal, really understanding what's going on, addressing all the medical problems going on, and prevention of further conditions. So I would say m &T has multiple layers to it. There has to be an in-depth individualized nutrition assessment. We're going to diagnose a specific nutrition problem and its etiology. What's the root cause? Etiology, what is the root cause of that problem? Let's say the problem is low iron stores. What's causing that? So if we just said, oh, you have low iron stores. Here, take this supplement. Is that gonna work? Maybe, maybe not. How do we know it's not because the individual doesn't have enough money to buy the right foods. Then we really have to talk about getting enough money. How do we know it's because the person doesn't have dentures and they can't chew meat? Then we have to talk about getting their teeth fixed, right? So the etiology, what is the real problem, um, the real reason for that problem? And then MNT is using specific evidence-based nutrition interventions to prevent or manage the condition. So um, evidence-based nutrition intervention. So that, I've hit over the head of many of you before, is really another um, key aspect to dietetics practice, evidence-based, always looking at the research. So what, is, what are some of our resources that we have as dietitians and that we're going to use in this class for our evidence? What do you think? Okay, so the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, it is a requirement that everybody in this class is a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics this senior year through the 161A, B, and 145 series. It's $50 student membership, it's like a textbook. The reason for that is because when you are a member, you have access to the, um, nutri no, it's not the Nutrition Care Manual, it's the, Evidence-based guidelines. Is that what somebody said? Is that what's called? Evidence-based guidelines. Oh, that is so nice. That was really loud. Yeah. The EAL, the Evidence Analyst Library. Thank you. Okay, I just needed a minute. Um, when you're a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, you have an automatic membership to the Evidence Analysis Library, the EAL Library, where um, Dietitians have sorted through the literature to answer questions and rated the evidence and have given us nice conclusions to, to the questions that come up in practice. So when we're looking at various topics, the EAL can provide evidence-based answers for us. So we're gonna do a little assignment using that. We haven't touched that yet, right? We haven't used that resource yet, great. So that's one of our resources, the Academy and the EAL Library. What's another resource, evidence-based resource that we're gonna use in this class in this entire year? PubMed, sure, PubMed, why not? Okay, what else? <laughs> our textbook, <laughs> it's brand new. So textbooks are always a little bit late, right, because it takes so long to write them. By the time they're published, they're outdated. But they seem to update this one all the time. So um, it is pretty new, and I must say it is very, very dense, way more than we could cover in an entire year of education. 
but it's a great resource. And we will be obviously using the textbook. Um, there's a load of information that you guys can learn and, and take in from the textbook. Um, I would never like have a test question from the textbook that we haven't gone over in class, so I'm not going to use the textbook like that. I don't expect you to like memorize the textbook, but it's a great resource. I think you should read it. I think you should look at our you know slides, come to class, um, go back and look at the textbook again, just to get clarification on topics to gain a better you know a deepness, maybe an additional layer um, to the content. It is it's really dense, um, so that's that's a resource for us. How many of you heard the Nutrition Care Manual? So the EAL feeds into the Nutrition Care Manual. The authors take information from the EAL and put it into a much more user-friendly format. The Nutrition Care Manual, and as Berkeley students, we all have access to that. The library has purchased a subscription for us. So um, in the syllabus, there's a link to getting to the Nutrition Care Manual, and we'll have an assignment looking at that as well. The Nutrition Care Manual is used in healthcare facilities. Um, dietitians use it. This is what they use as their, like, uh, used to call it a diet manual, um, a manual of all the diets that they would recommend in the hospital. It's where you can get education materials for patients. It's basically, like in the morning when I go in to see patients, if there's a condition that I don't really remember or know that much about, I'll go to the nutrition care manual and I'll look up that condition and it gives you the physiology, the pathophysiology of the disease, the labs that you might be looking for, why they might be off, what the diet recommendations would be and why, an education material, it basically tells you what to do. <laughs> um, not so much because you that wouldn't be, so if it just told you what to do, would that be MNT? No. No, exactly. So it gives you a foundation. It reminds you of what you should be thinking about um, when seeing patients with that. Then you have to dive deeper, right? I like that. I dive deeper. Digging, although that's digging. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we're evidence based. Um, oh, and I thought, did anybody, like, what are these other nutrition professionals that, did anybody read that and go, what? I don't know if you did or didn't. So it is um, true that you do not have to be a registered dietitian nutritionist to practice medical nutrition therapy. Legislation says a registered dietitian or a nutrition professional, and that nutrition professional would be somebody that a doctor has decided is qualified to provide the nutrition, the MNT, and that person has to hold a master's degree. So, and, and, um, JCO, our regulatory agency, um, so basically, the doctor would have to take liability for that person as well. And when JACO, our regulatory agency, comes in to hospitals to say, hey, who's on your staff and who's providing MNT, they would also have to find that person qualified to do the job. So the RD credential is like an easier way to do that, right? It's like, oh, they're an RD, it's in the legislation, it's done, and a nutrition professional, other individuals can't do it. Just the doctor has to take responsibility, they have to be brought in in the nutrition services and Jayco has to find them, you know, credible as well. Um, and the doctor has to take responsibility for that. Any questions about that? So that doesn't happen very often. Most hospitals have RDNs, but there are some in some clinics where individuals with master's degrees are providing MNT um, because the doctor has decided that that person is qualified to do so. Of course, yes. So doctors are the bosses, right, of the patient. <laughs> and so they are able to do anything, right, um, in their scope of practice, right? So if they're a pulmonologist, they aren't going to be doing, you know, cardiovascular procedures, obviously. But um, doctors take responsibility for the patient. So if the nurse is supposed to give the medication, well, certainly the doctor could do that too. If the dietitian is supposed to give the nutrition education, certainly the doctor could do that too, right? So they're able to do those services um, with their education. We do work as dietitians under doctors and alongside the healthcare team. Um, so who else is on our healthcare team? Nurses. Nurses. We rely on nurses a lot to get a lot of information 
about the patient because who sees the patient for many hours a day? The nurse. <laughs> um, we will see maybe, I don't know, be managing 15, 20 patients in a day and the nurse, depends on the hospital, in the ICU could have three patients, so they know everything going on with that, or it could be a busier floor, like the medical surgical unit, where maybe they have like six patients, um, or it could be a step-down unit where the care is lower because the needs aren't as high, and they might have 12 patients, but the nurses know what is going on with that patient. Um, so we get lots of information about what patients are eating, what their stools are like, if they're dehydrated, what their medications are, if they're throwing up, all sorts of things. Who else is on our healthcare team? Doctors, dietitians, nurses, pharmacists. Yep, yeah. pharmacists. Talk to the pharmacists a lot, especially when we're doing parenteral nutrition, getting nutrition through the IV into a vein directly. It's a pharmacy order. It's a drug. They write it up. We make recommendations, and they write it up and um, deliver it to patients. Text. Text, diet text? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, nutrition assistants or dietetic technicians that are gathering some nutrition information for us, delivering the meals, asking the patient what they like to eat. Speech language pathologist. Yeah, so speech in the hospital. Um, they are there to work with swallowing, chewing and swallowing issues. So we work very closely with speech in some just you know some types of conditions. Um, occupational therapists are therapists that are getting people back to work. Um, so making sure that they have the movements that they need to do their jobs. And a lot of movements in life are movements that require eating and food preparation. So we're working with occupational therapists to make sure that the patient is ready to go home and prepare their own foods. Physical therapists. They're helping patients get stronger out the door, right? So they can walk. Um, and we're monitoring their ability to walk and be strong as well because that's a sign of nutritional status. If somebody is has so little muscle that they're not strong enough to function, we could call them malnourished. Um, but if we see their functional status is getting better and their muscles are getting bigger, their nutritional status is improving. How did they get those muscles? Well, some exercise, but also nutrition. We need food to do that, right? So we work alongside all of these disciplines, and we're all communicating with one another. Social work is another one. Does anybody want to be a social worker in here? So social work, is the patient ready to be discharged? Where are they going to go when they leave? Are they going to back to their home? Is there anybody there to help watch them and take care of them? And how does that relate to us? Well, when they go home, is there anybody there that's going to help them prepare food, right? Are they going to live alone? Are they going to get sick? And are they going to come back to the hospital? Or is the social worker coordinating their care so that they're going to a skilled nursing facility where there's going to be um, food provided and housing provided, right? And if so, we need to communicate to the skilled nursing facility what their nutritional needs are. So we're communicating with every member in the healthcare team, which is really exciting, right? Isn't that fun? It is. Okay, um, so why do we do it? Why do we do MNT? We do it, um, I guess, what are the outcomes? What is the benefit? <laughs> is there a benefit, right? I mean, we all maybe have a passion for it and we think it's important, but just having a passion for it and thinking it's important isn't enough to support paying for it. Unfortunately, we're in this world of Money, right? Money is really important. The bottom line is really important. We have to prove that we're effective and that we have benefit. Um, so these are some of the outcomes. This is an incomplete list, but just, you know, so we know some of them because you do need to know what is your outcome? What, what is it that you're doing? What is the benefit of it? This is incredibly important, right? Um, so we do have improved health outcomes for diabetes. So less long-term complications with blindness and amputations and um, going on dialysis, those type of outcomes for hypertension, dyslipidemia, HIV, pregnancy, et cetera. So we have improved health outcomes for a variety of conditions. Um, we also, thinking about that 
primary prevention and that lower level of prevention, research has shown that we have reduced risk of developing diabetes and chronic diseases. So when we can catch patients that are just starting to show signs and we implement MNT, which is not just nutrition education, but it's individualized assessments with evidence-based guidelines for management and prevention of disease, we actually prevent the development of diabetes. So people never get it in the first place in other chronic diseases. So that is huge and that is very cost-saving. Um, with research, we have seen reduced number of hospitalizations with medical nutrition therapy interventions. Um, and readmissions, which is huge. So now with the Affordable Care Act, oh yes, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, we're looking at the bottom line, right? And there are incentives for programs that do not have readmissions. <laughs> so let, let me say it a different way. Um, for certain conditions, when patients go to the hospital and they're discharged, if the patient gets readmitted for the same diagnosis within a certain period of time, the hospital is penalized. They do not want readmissions. Medicare will not pay them if that patient is readmitted. So we have actually seen that we prevent readmissions. So that's huge. We're saving hospitals healthcare dollars. Yeah, we're saving them. We're making them money. We're saving them money. Um, reduced number of doctor visits. Decreased medication use. For dyslipidemia, patients that undergo MNT can um, lower their prescriptions or go off medications at times. Um, reduced number of sick days. So productivity for the employer. Medical nutrition therapy increases productivity. Um, so with diabetes, being out because you're on dialysis means people can't be at work or having sick days because they have diabetes um, are examples of that. Um, enhanced quality of life. So let's not forget about that. These other ones are really big, but quality of life is really important as well. And that is mainly with heart failure and reducing the fluid that people carry on their bodies so they can breathe better and they can function better in their daily living. So that's huge. And then cost savings for every dollar spent on medical nutrition therapy, there is a $2.60 to a $15 savings. Um, and that varies by study and outcome, obviously. That's a huge range. But multiple studies have found cost savings with MNT. So that um, is obviously incredibly important. And that's often the bottom line for many hospitals and employers and facilities is how much is it going to cost plus the benefit, cost benefit analysis. Okay, so um, breathe, it's 2.50, okay, <laughs> room is getting warm. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Are we excited? Are we excited for the class? Kind of? Yay! <laughs> Um, so how many of you want to work as in as a healthcare provider? How about that? As a healthcare provider. Okay, okay. Um, how many of you want to work in a hospital? Okay, smaller numbers. How many want to work in outpatient services? All right, similar number. Um, what did I miss? Those that didn't raise your hand, what do you want to do? Food service. Food service, okay. Did you know? <laughs> One of the largest food service operations is a hospital <laughs> food service operation, <laughs> right? Are you thinking about hospital food service? So did you raise your hand? You did? Kind of, kind of rose a little bit. So um, huge, huge, huge. So I mean, everything in this class will actually relate to that because in hospital food service management, you are developing the menus and diets for all the disease states. Right, And you need to be able to have your system work where the patient's needs are being met in the kitchen. And then that's being actually delivered to the patient in a safe way. Um, so incredibly related, right? Okay, what else? Who else didn't raise their hand? What else, what do you wanna do? What do you wanna do in your book? Yeah. Um, probably like the business side of Maybe like medical technology. Okay, okay, nice. Um, 
So this is a great foundation class for that. I'm not trying to sell the class, but I'm just trying to relate it. I'm just trying to relate it because medical, you know, understanding the medical world and how it works and conditions is going to be incredibly, incredibly important with that. And dietetics, I just want to say, there is a business side to everything we do. That last slide I showed of all the outcomes, that's the business. That's the business of dietetics. We do have to have a product. Our product is MNT, and it has to work. That. That's a business model, right? Kind of one of the business models, I'm sure. So um, we're always proving our effectiveness, tracking our outcomes, looking at the bottom line. Anybody else want to share what they want to do? What they want to do? Yeah, you have something else. So that's great. That's a great. So let's think about sports nutrition. Um, is sports nutrition MNT? Right, is it MNT? That's where it's like, oh, no. So we're applying the digging deep. So we are applying the nutrition care process to sports nutrition. Because if you're going to work with a person, or actually anything you do in dietetics, you want to really assess and understand that person. So in sports nutrition, you're going to apply the first, like, 60% of this class, which is the life span and the nutrition care process in sports nutrition, but because it's not a disease, <laughs> um, it's not, you know, MNT in that sense, but it has aspects to it, especially the nutrition care process aspect to it. So, you know, you're thinking about that person's optimal nutritional requirements or optimal nutritional status and their requirements are largely influenced by their sport, right? So we're applying the same process. So, fantastic. Um, where do we practice MNT? So I already mentioned hospitals, it's gonna be inpatient. Outpatients, what does outpatient mean? It means ambulatory services where people can walk and go in to an outpatient clinic, right? So dietitians can have a private practice um, in their home <laughs> um, or rent out a space, right? And so that would be an ambulatory service. Or you can have an office in an outpatient facility alongside the physician's, you know, office and, you know, the pharmacy and health education or whatever that may be. Um, so outpatient services. Um, and some dietitians practice in the physician's office. So a physician will hire a dietitian to practice MNT in that office. So maybe they have a little office in the physician's office and the doctor just either sends patients over or the dietitian walks in to the appointment and sees the patient right after the physician does or something like that. Um, so when I worked at the heart disease clinic, um, the patient would go into a room and the pharmacist would first go in and get information, bring it back to the healthcare team. I would go in, talk about nutrition, I would leave, then the doctor would go in do what they wanted to do, and then leave. And so the patient was really there for like two hours. It was a very long, horrible experience. But they got all of their care at one time by all the disciplines. Um, and so it took so long because it was a teaching hospital, so there were so many different layers to the care. But that's one way it's done as well. And then the long-term care facilities, MNT is practiced as well. If people are in a facility for um, rehab and um, you know healing from spinal cord injury or major injuries, there would be nutrition services there, both in the food service domain, but also dietitians working with that individual to help rehab them, assisted living facilities, skilled nursing facilities where patients live there for the rest of their lives, right? The dietitian has to be there through our, our regulators that regulate our healthcare system. There has to be nutrition services um, in these facilities to manage their nutritional status. Because you know what happens in a lot of assisted living facilities is malnutrition. And patients just kind of get lost to the whole follow-up thing. And they're not eating well and nobody's really paying attention. Uh, pressure ulcers happen and things like that. And so it's essential to have somebody there paying attention to what's going on. Any questions? So ultimately this class is ready, getting you ready to work in the hospital, to work in the outpatient settings, and to get ready for this critical care environment, this hospital environment. This is a pre-professional dietetics <coughs> class. It is a requirement before you start a dietetic internship, um, and it is the foundation of 
much of dietetics practice and, and what we do, no matter what discipline you work in, um, this is going to be very relevant. So, I want to use stretch and stuff like that, and then we'll look at the syllabus, and then I'll do a little bit more talking. Um, <laughs> so, this is the course is called. Um, this is the nutrition care process. So, if you haven't seen it, can you read it? Is it too small? A little small. Oh, guess what? I made copies. Because <laughs> I knew it might be too small. So, it's just the process that we use to think about nutrition care. In the center of this process is the provider and the patient interaction and relationship. And that patient could be your population if you're working in public health. Um, it could be whomever you're working with, right? In whatever discipline this is. But we're gonna call it in this class the patient client and so how do we work with these clients that's my map I had to make sure I got I had to make sure I found Barrow's Hall <laughs> I've been here 10 years I still don't know the campus <laughs> oh I did only make 30 copies can you share I don't know I made 37 of those things and I made 30 of something else just scoot in, just scoot in. Okay, uh, do we have an extra? How many people are, oh, you have an extra? Oh, great. You don't need it? Yeah, are you dropping the class? Oh, no, I have an extra. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, there you go. Okay, so what uh, influences, or how do we interact with our patients and our population? How does this actually occur? And um, it starts with the screening and referral process. So as I said, you can't see every single healthy person. It's not possible. So we screen and we identify people that will get the most from us. Who needs us the most? Who um, would benefit the most from seeing the dietitian? So we screen for that and you take these higher risk patients, the people we think would benefit, and they go into our system. <laughs> um, and we're going to skip the outer ring for now and the gray ring. We're just going to look in the middle here. So you can see it's numbered one, two, three, four, right? And so then we have our nutrition assessment. So our nutrition assessment is where we're diving deep. We're assessing somebody's nutritional status. After we gather that information, we analyze it, we think about it, and we come up with a diagnosis. What's the nutrition problem? Right? What's the root cause of that problem? Then we come up with interventions for that problem. And then we monitor and evaluate our outcomes to see if the problem went away. Right? So we never just provide care and then walk away. You want to know, did that care do anything? Is the problem gone? If not, then we you know, go back to that nutrition assessment, figure out what's going on, come up with a diagnosis, intervention, monitor and evaluate. So A-D-I-M-E, assessment, A, D, diagnosis. This is a nutritional diagnosis. I, intervention, M-E, monitoring and evaluation. So ADIME, we call this the ADIME. ADIME format is the nutrition care process. When we document our care, we document in an ADIME format. We put all of our assessment information together, then we write a diagnosis, then we write our interventions, and then we write our monitoring and evaluation plan. A-D-I-M-E, A-D-I-M-E, okay? And that is what's gonna help us interact with our patients. So, um, again, it starts with screening, um, evaluation. So, you know, what is in our A? Our assessment is all of these factors that we just talked about that impact one's optimal nutritional status. This is our assessment. We're assessing disease state, if they have a fever, their physiological stress, growth, psychological stress, their body, their well-being, their environment, any mechanical problems they have, their economics, their behavior, everything about this person we're assessing. That's our A. 
and we organize it according to our A, B, C, Ds, and Ps. That's our assessment. So we have our A, D, I, M, E, our A, D, I, M, note, our A, D, I, M, this is the whole process. And in that A, we're assessing our A, B, C, Ds, and Ps, which are our anthropometric measures. So we're looking at somebody's body composition. They're underweight. We're going to have to give more calories, right? We're going to optimize their nutritional status, help them build muscle mass, build fat stores. Uh, we look at their labs. So our B is our labs, our biochemical data, any medical tests and procedures that are going on that are going to influence our nutritional care. Our C is our client history. This is huge. We're going to start there on Tuesday. That's the background of the patient, everything about the patient that they want to tell us. D is our diet history. This is what makes dietitians unique. Our care is unique. No other healthcare provider is doing a diet history for the most part, although more and more know how important diet is. And so doctors are starting to ask a little bit more about diet. Nurses are starting to ask a little bit more about diet. Um, but we do that too. And then P is new in the last like four years. Um, nutrition focused physical findings. So doing a physical exam, touching, palpating um, patients to feel for bone, muscle, and fat stores is the most common way it's being used now, and it's a huge push to do that right now. You can also look for micronutrients. So that's looking at macronutrients, right? Do they have enough energy? Are we giving them enough energy? We, if we're not giving them enough, enough energy, they're going to lose fat and muscle stores, right? Um, but we can also look for micronutrient deficiencies. So if you think back to MST10 and um, signs of micronutrient deficiencies that we might see. So we can look at nails, we can look at the tongue, the mouth, cracks in the lips, dry scaly skin, things like that um, as well to give support for the nutrition diagnosis and the problem. So. This is what we're going to spend a lot of time on, these A, B, C, Ds, and Ps. So where does the data come from? Where do you think? Where do we get this data? Well, if we're touching, where is that coming from? The patient. The patient, right. OK, so we're going we're gonna to be gathering the information from the patient by feeling the patient. Electronic health record, absolutely. So other healthcare providers have gathered much of this information and we're gonna read the notes and gather our information that way from other healthcare providers. The client is gonna tell us, we're gonna ask questions, we're gonna have an interview, a conversation, a very friendly conversation. Actually, it's not an interview, although we do call it a diet interview sometimes, but it really can be, I'm gonna to touch you, can be a, <coughs> Tell me, tell me how you're feeling. <laughs> I just went to a training on the physical exam and they said, go up there and hand. She said, as you're talking, <laughs> we're going to practice with some of that. Um, but yeah, having a conversation, right, with Stephanie here about um, what's going on in her life. How else? Client, providers, electronic healthcare providers, yeah. Uh, if they've been in the hospital for a while, would you like to look to see what they've been receiving? Great, yeah. So um, what they've actually been doing in the hospital. So we can physically observe the food, observe, I think I have a hard time saying that word, observe the food that they're eating, that they were given, and how much of it they're eating. Um, nurses do that as well, as we can ask the nurses for that information. But yeah, we can sit down and have meals with them and see what's going on. So client interviews, observation, measurements that we're going to take, medical records, healthcare providers. And then what do we do with the data? We gather this data. What are we going to do with it? What? Analyze it. Exactly. So to analyze it, we're going to compare it to the norm or the standard, right? The gold standard. So we can analyze it and decide, is this good or bad, right? Is this within normal limits or outside of the normal limits. We have to do something about this. So compare it to the standards for interpretation. 
So if you know we're looking at a diet interview and what somebody's eating, we're gonna compare it to what their nutrient needs are. So we need to know what somebody's nutrient needs are. Calories, protein, and micronutrients, and fluid, right? So what do they need? How much are they eating? Are they above or under? That is a process that we're gonna have to go through to become familiar with how to do that. Labs, look at the normal range. Is their lab high or low? What am I gonna do about it, right? How does that change my care for this patient? Their anthropometrics, so looking at their height and their weight, um, and their muscle stores, and where their extra body stores might be, um, and then we compare it to the standards of their desirable body weight, more importantly, their usual body weight, um, their BMI. Nutrition-focused physical exam, we're gonna compare it to what a normal state would be, and looking at their disease states, comparing what's going on with the disease to a healthy state, right? How does this disease change the physiology of this person and what my care is gonna be? So comparing to what somebody would be doing in a normal healthy state. That makes sense, you're just comparing it to the norm, right? And then so you can make an assessment. So, yeah. Nutrition focused physical exam. Lots of abbreviations. Um, so we'll just finish this, and then I, I never get to the rest of the lecture. This is my lot in life and lecturing. I never finish my slides. <laughs> Don't put it on my evaluation. It's not going to change anything. <laughs> I just cannot get to my, all my slides. Um, but we will always get to them in some form or fashion. Just not always on the day I think I'm going to get on. Okay. Probably because I do a lot of this self talk so, um, okay, so we gather this information, then we make a nutrition diagnosis, right? We've already talked about this. Um, what I haven't told you is we have standardized language for our diagnosis. It is standardized wording. We have like four pages of diagnoses that we can select from. Um, and the reason why this is a standardized process is so that we can track our outcomes. So if we can track our, our diagnoses and our problems, we can see how dietitians are intervening on these problems, and we should be able to look at outcomes and maybe aggregate that data and show our effectiveness. So the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is all about showing effectiveness and they need to, and it's really important because that's how we get paid and that's how we have a profession and that's how we set ourselves apart from anybody else that wants to provide nutrition care. You have to show your effectiveness. So um, this is the early steps in that, is coming up with standardized problems. Of course, standardized, the problem is standardized, but that doesn't mean every patient's gonna have the same problem, obviously, right? We have four pages of, of problems. Um, that was the first step so we can really track track our data and outcomes. And just this year, they now have a system for collecting all of that information. <coughs> so we'll be able to talk about that at some point, that new system. Not in this class, probably. But, um, so we now have a diagnosis. We know what the problem is, right? Like inadequate protein intake could be the problem. And then we have to come up with an intervention for it, right? So what are our interventions in nutrition care? What do we do as dietitians? What are some of our interventions? Yes. Nutrition education. Yeah, so we educate people. Modify diets. We modify their diets in the hospital. So add more protein, add less protein. Nutrition Okay, delivery of the meals, um, food and nutrition delivery would be similar to modifying diets, but we would expand on it with nutrition delivery in that we can give supplements, um, we can give extra snacks, um, we can give multivitamin minerals, so that would all be delivering nutrition to people. We can provide enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition, so that's nutrient, nutrition delivery, nutrient delivery. Okay, so we educate and we provide food and supplements and enteral and parenteral nutrition. What else do we do? 
just to mark classifications of interventions. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay, so nutrition counseling. So education is different from counseling. Education is, here, do this. Counseling is, and why is this gonna be really hard for you, and how can we make it easier, and what's the likelihood you're actually gonna do it, and you know, who's gonna help you along the way, and diving deep, I love counseling, super fun. Um, and then the last intervention that we have is coordination of care. Believe it or not, we coordinate a lot of care. Um, so, like I already gave some examples, when the patient goes home, how is this intervention going to be maintained? Coordinating with the skilled nursing facility, coordinating with Meals on Wheels, coordinating with the senior center, coordinating with the aunt that is gonna take care of the child, et cetera, right? Coordinating, that sounds good, okay. <laughs> um, and that's what we do. So food is our intervention, really. So the big one is food delivery. Providing food, changing diets, changing the nutritional composition of the diet, providing extra food. Okay. Um, and then is the job done? The job's not done, because then we have to make sure we did something, like it, it resolved the problem. So we monitor and evaluate our interventions. So what do you think you're going to look for? So we want to see if the problem is resolved, right? We want to see if the diagnosis is gone. What are we going to look for to see if the diagnosis is gone after we gave our intervention? Biomarkers. Okay, so biomarkers would be one example. Would you not just find who was giving the question? Yep, exactly. So you reassess. You look at all of the um, assessment data because that's what told you what the diagnosis was in the first place. So now you're going to look at the same assessment data to see if the problem is gone, right? Now, your initial assessment is very deep because we're looking at everything. Once you have identified the problem, usually that problem isn't going to reflect everything. Maybe you found like five things in your assessment data that have told you about this problem. So you're only going to monitor and evaluate those five things. You're not going to necessarily go back to everything right away. But say you have a patient in the inpatient that now is there 10 days. Well, by ten, day 10, you're probably looking at everything again because new things may have come up. But if you like give an intervention and then you go back two days later, something should have changed, right? So that's what you're going to look at for your monitoring and evaluating. But um, you know you don't have to look at everything. But by day 10. Other, why are they still there, right? Nobody's in the hospital 10 days anymore. They're in the hospital on day 10. Other things have come up, and you've got to look at all of your assessment data. So that's called a um, reassessment. It's really fancy. So you do your assessment, and then your monitoring. You just have a follow-up visit, and then you have a reassessment, which means you're looking at everything. Any questions? Yes? In like an outpatient setting, because obviously in the hospital, like we're giving them mm -hmm. what they're going to eat. Mm -hmm. so, like in an outpatient setting, do we talk about like accountability at all or like the person deciding whether they're going to follow what you give them? Definitely. So that would be in our nutrition counseling. Um, we would talk about accountability and that it's their life and they're the only ones that are going to make this happen outside of these walls, you know, and what's their motivation and interest and yeah. So that we talked about that in 145, but definitely. Um, and in the outpatient setting, it's harder to have this great monitoring and evaluation data because they're back in real life. You know, you have this one hour really fantastic session, but then they go back to their life. And so it's really hard for people to change, right? In the inpatient setting, why so many dietitians like the inpatient setting is because there's control, right? You are feeding them this, and the labs are right there, and they have no choices because it's all right in those walls. <laughs> and so they like that, you know, tightness of it. Um, and in the outpatient setting, yeah, it's not, you're not going to see the outcomes change as quickly. You sure will if they do it, but you've got to really work with people to make that happen. And that's exciting. I love that. It's super fun, but it's challenging. Yes? Uh, so your assessment is uh, looking at all of the interventions. Is that sent to every patient, or just if they stay with you? So, um, so we do our initial assessment, and then it depends on their risk level, right? So imagine somebody in the ICU is very um, 
at very high risk for becoming malnourished. They are sedated. They're not eating, right? We're maybe giving them enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition. Um, you, they're gonna be high risk. You're gonna visit them much more often than somebody that went in and got their appendix out and they got flagged because they were throwing up before they came into the hospital because they, got, they had appendicitis, right? They had a lot of pain, they were throwing up. That flags the dietitian, vomiting. Because vomiting means, yikes, they're not getting their ins. That nutrition, optimal nutritional status is your ins and your requirements, right? So they're throwing up, they're not getting their ins, they're flagged, but then you find out, well, yeah, they had appendicitis. This person is very low risk. You're not gonna see them as often, right? If ever again. But if that appendicitis person ended up getting an infection and, or let's say something even crazier, like when they went to remove the appendicitis, they punctured the intestine, okay? <laughs> I don't know, I'm coming up with a wild story. But now they're in the hospital for 10 days. You're gonna see them again and do that full assessment. So the simple answer is that it just depends on the patient how often you're gonna do that. Some facilities have very clear guidelines and some facilities, it like, is more up to the dietitian's um, professional opinion as to when they do a full reassessment. Um, okay, so we're monitoring again all these assessment parameters. And then what comes out of this, so in is the screening and we go through the system, and then what comes out is our outcome management system, as I just mentioned. So this is, um, this says, who wants to say, what does it say? I don't have a copy that's nice and big. What does it say? Research. Research nutrition care process. You can give research to the nutrition care process. That line didn't make sense. What are the next ones? Use aggregated data to conduct research. Use aggregated data to conduct research. So we are gonna aggregate our data. They want us, they being the Academy of the Powers That Be, they want us to collect and aggregate our data to look at our overall effectiveness and then publish it if you can, um, that you did a chart review or whatever, or at least share it within your discipline. What else does it say? Conduct continuous quality. Conduct continuous quality improvement. So guess what, your system didn't work. Quality improvement, why didn't it work? What went wrong? You recommended uh, uh, Ensure to give, you know, you recommended nutrition supplements. It never got to the patient. That is a problem. That's continuous quality improvement. Somebody's gotta go through the charts. Did these interventions get implemented? If not, why? And that's an exciting job. The clinical manager usually does this. They're looking at our process and what's supposed to be happening. Is it happening? Are we getting referrals from you know, high-risk referrals? Are we applying this process? Is our intervention actually happening? If not, why? Um, and so actually a lot of students work with dietitians to do continuous quality improvement and analysis. I posted something last year, um, Alameda Health System, she had a bunch of projects. Is anybody in this class working with Poonam? Yeah? Not anymore. Not anymore. Like, and I want to hear all about it. Okay. <laughs> but she wanted some of this done, that was her, her goal. Um, okay, so that's the system. And perfect, we ended on time. Um, I think that you guys can read about medical terminology on your own. So like I said, we are learning a new language. I want you to read my slides. I posted them. There's like six slides on how to interpret medical terms and how to understand them. Um, and I want you to give this worksheet a try that I'm going to give you. I think that we are all capable of doing this without me going through all of the views. And then we'll answer questions on Tuesday. So do your best job. It doesn't have to be perfect. I'm sure actually you'll do perfect because it makes perfect sense if you read my slides. And I have um, 